my screen uh, with you. And uh, we will be looking at um, a sermon that I entitled uh, Name Him Yeshua. Hope everybody can see that. Okay, I think you can. Based on Matthew one twenty one, you know it's interesting that our our parasha today is called Shemot from names. Huh? The book of Exodus is called Shemot names because it starts mentioning names uh, in uh, in the list of of Israel's as they were together. So I want to uh, begin by uh, sharing a few things, make you think about the names and make you think about Yeshua. You know, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion sometimes um, about Yeshua's birth, about uh, this time of the year. Should we celebrate? Shouldn't we mention? What would we do as Jewish believers, as Gentile believers? Some things are right, some things are wrong. There's a lot of discussion. So I want to I want to ask a few questions. I want you to think, and as we think together, think about some things that are important, and then we'll I'll share my heart with you. Um, but I want us to look at a few things as we begin before we go to the what I want to share today. During this time of the year, as we think about the birth of our Messiah, Yeshua, uh, I think we should ask ourselves some questions. And I want you to ask yourself these questions today. Uh, was his birth part of God's eternal plan of redemption for all mankind? Did God plan this from eternity? Was it a, a last minute thing or did he plan it? Was his birth promised and prophesied for many centuries prior to his coming? Uh, did God give us hints in the Old Testament before he sent Messiah? What is, was his birth mentioned throughout the Old Testament? Was his birth the fulfillment of God's covenant with Israel? You know, we have covenants in the Old Testament. We celebrate the covenants of God. You know, the Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the uh, Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant. Was his birth part of this plan of God for Israel as he fulfilled the covenants? Do you realize that without his miraculous incarnation, no one would obtain forgiveness of sin, salvation from eternal condemnation, abundant life here and eternal life after death. You know, because if God didn't become man as he did in Yeshua, all of the things that we enjoy, forgiveness, salvation, abundant life, eternal life, we wouldn't have. Do you see that if he had not been born, he would not have taught us all that he did teach us and would not have interpreted the Tanah, the Old Testament, as only he could, as he brought it to life to us as well. We wouldn't have all that if he wasn't born. Do you realize that if he had not been born, he would have not lived a perfect life as an example for us to follow? We follow Yeshua. That's what we say. We're believers in Yeshua. We follow him. How do you follow him? You look at his life. Well, if he wasn't born, we couldn't have his life example to follow. Do you realize that if he had not been born as a man, he could not have suffered and died to pay for the penalty of our sins? As you know, God demanded sacrifices to cover our sins, to forgive us of our sins. And because of the sacrifices that God commanded uh, through history had been uh, dealt with in a different way sometimes. And Israel sometimes in history had not put their heart into uh, the sacrifices that God ordained. And, and so therefore God had said, well, uh, sometimes through the prophets, I don't accept your sacrifices. I abhor your sacrifices. So he took care of a per he needed a perfect sacrifice 
and he sent his own son to cover for our sins. Do you see that if he had not been born, he would have not have been the perfect Passover lamb or the perfect atonement for the sins of Israel and all mankind. As, as you know, we celebrate the feast of Israel and some of them have already been fulfilled in Yeshua. And some of them will be fulfilled in Yeshua with the second coming. Uh, but one of the ones that we celebrate so dearly to us, the Passover, Pesach, and uh, all the images and all the symbols of Pesach point towards Yeshua as a Passover lamb, the perfect atonement for our sins. If he hadn't been born, he could have not fulfilled this. And do you realize that if he had not been born, lived, suffered, and died as he did, he would have not conquered death by, raising, by rising from the tomb. He is the only one that rose from the dead and lived forever. You know, he performed miracles, and we read in scripture that he raised others from the dead, but those that were raised from the dead died again eventually. But Yeshua is the only one that, after having died, rose from the dead and now lives forever. And so do you see that because of all this, we have the hope of our own resurrection and the assurance of eternal life. That's what he promised us, because where I go, you shall live also. Where I, because I live, you will be also, he said. And he told us he, he went to prepare as he ascended into heaven. He went to prepare a place for us, for those believers that follow him. And he gave us assurance that we spend eternity with him if he hadn't been born. We wouldn't have had all that. So these biblical characters, Miriam, his mother, huh? Joseph, his, his earthly father, Elizabeth, and Zechariah, Yeshua's uncles, and Simeon, the man that we talked about a few weeks ago, the one man at the temple, a righteous man who saw him, and he saw him as, a, as God's promise being fulfilled. And Hannah, the, the prophetess, that he, she praised the Lord at the temple and shared with everyone that the Messiah promise had come. The shepherds that were in the field and heard the angels and went to worship uh, Yeshua. The angels that sang glory to God. The wise men that came from the east to worship Yeshua. Matthew, who wrote about his birth. Mark, uh, the gospel writer. Luke. John, the gospel writers, uh, realized all this. John the baptizer, Yohanan, his cousin, his earthly cousin, then the rest of the apostles, and even Paul, Rabbi Shaul, and thousands of Yeshua's followers answered yes to all these questions that we posed. Why? Because they realized that his birth was the fulfillment of God's promises and covenants with Israel. So this, they, they, they answered yes to these things because they saw who he was and God fulfilling his promises. And that's why they thought it was important to rejoice and celebrate Yeshua's birth. And they did rejoice in his birth and did give glory to God. Now, uh, there are many passages. That's why God included many passages of scripture in the Old Testament that talk about his coming. These are just a few, Genesis 3.15, 2 Samuel 7, 12-14, Isaiah 7.14, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, Micah 5.2 and others, the Psalms and others from, uh, from the, uh, from the uh, prophets and uh, the writings. Uh, there's, there's hundreds and hundreds of mentions of Yeshua's birth. That's why God included it, because he's an important part of our faith. That's why the gospel, uh, the gospel writer Matthew and Luke dedicate two chapters in each gospel about Yeshua's birth, because it was an important event, a critical event in God's plan. And that's why, as well, John writes in this gospel, the first chapter, about the word being incarnate and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory. And the light, he was the light that came to the world because they realized this was uh, God's 
promises and prophecies being fulfilled about the coming Messiah. And that's why Rabbi Shaul, Paul, makes reference to his birth several times in his writings, but especially in the book of Philippians chapter 2, and we're going to look at that in a few minutes. So there's, there is plenty of reasons why it's important. Now, we can disagree on the date of his birth. In fact, as we know, the date was just chosen by some leaders many centuries later, uh, just to put a date to celebrate his birth. And I understand that we can disagree on that, but what, what better time is my thinking, and I'm suggesting to you, what better time to tell others about the real meaning of this Christmas, or if you want to call it Messiah Mass, as some call it, or as some of us call it Yom Yeshua, the day of Messiah, the day of Jesus, the day of Yeshua. What better time to tell others about the real meaning of his life than when everybody is at least thinking about it or has heard something about it. You know, people celebrate this Christmas with doing all kinds of things that have nothing to do with Jesus. I realize that. But some people know, or at least the name comes from, it's included there, Christ, Messiah. Uh, at least they've heard something about it. At least they know that some congregations and churches are thinking about Yeshua. At least they know something. So why not? take advantage of this time to tell others about his birth. What better time to tell others about the, the birth of Messiah than when many churches, as I said, rightly or wrongly, are celebrating his birth. Sometimes they have things that are just traditions, but we have some of those as well. But what a better time to take advantage of this and do it. I, I like what Paul, Rabbi Shaul, says in in Philippians 1, 1 uh, 15 through 18. Remember, he was in jail. He was in prison, and it says that some people were using this, uh, his, his being in prison as something. Uh, let me read some of those verses to you. Uh, starting on verse 12, for instance, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has actually resulted in the advances of the gospel, advancement of the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for messiah most of the brothers in the lord have gained confidence from my imprisonment and dare even more to speak the message fearlessly but then in verse 15 he says some to be sure preach messiah out of envy and strife but others out of goodwill these do so out of love knowing that i'm appointed to the defense of the gospel the others Proclaim Messiah out of rivalry, not sincerely, seeking to cause me trouble in my imprisonment. What does it matter, he says in verse 18? Just that in every way, whether out of false motives or true, Messiah is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice. So in other words, he says, even when there's some wrong reasons and it's not done the right way, at least the name of Messiah. Christ is being proclaimed. And so my, as, I, as we go to the introduction, I, I just say something that his birth occur, occurred during Sukkot because of, you know, John mentioning, you know, God tabernacled among us and be, we held, beheld his glory. Some say because the shepherds were out in the field, so it must have not been too, too cold, so it would make sense. Uh, celebrated Sukkot as a better date, maybe, although I've read uh, lately that some of the shepherds in the Middle East stay out all year round with the sheep, but that's okay. That could be, a Sukkot could be a good date. Well, I would say then let's celebrate it during Sukkot. Let's, let's make a big deal about Messiah coming in Sukkot, but the truth of the matter is that most of us don't think about uh, celebrating the Messiah's birth during Sukkot. We celebrate what Israel did during the during the wilderness, and uh, we do all that, but very few, uh, at least I haven't heard uh, anyone mention it, the birth of Messiah during Sukkot. So some people use the argument that uh, we are not commanded in Scripture to celebrate his birth. Well, this is true. We're not commanded, but remember that neither are we commanded by God to celebrate Purim. Yes, we do celebrate it because the Jewish people 
decided uh, God saved them in such a way there in the book of Esther, uh, did a miraculous way to save them, delivered them. So they decided to celebrate it because it was a great event that we do celebrate. It. And, you know, we're not even commanded by God to celebrate Hanukkah. Yes, we do it as Jewish people, as Jewish believers, because of the way God delivered Israel again. And uh, it's even written in books that are not considered inspired word of God or the book of Maccabees, although they are historical books. So we do celebrate it. So I say, you know, we do celebrate other traditions as well that are not necessarily commanded by God. We, we have traditions, that's like Christian churches have traditions, Jewish, Jewish believers have traditions that are not necessarily, but they're good things. So I say, how much more important is it for followers of Yeshua to celebrate his birth and, and to celebrate other things? So uh, that, is, that is something that I, I want to share you as a, uh, as, as an introduction, again, this is my thought, my, my heart felt, and that's why I asked the questions. I don't know why other people even give gifts at this time. Uh, my wife and I love to give gifts and uh, because we respond to God's greatest gift, his only son, Yeshua, Hamashiach. As we read in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave. Huh? He gave us his only son. And as a response to that in love, we also share gifts with others. And just like we give gifts in Hanukkah, I think Yom Yeshua, our Messiah, Mother Christmas can be a great time of rejoicing, showing our love in tangible ways. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not wanting, please understand me, I'm not commanding, asking you to celebrate Christmas. I'm just, I just think that each of us has the freedom to celebrate it or not, but I hope you do celebrate Messiah's birth at some point during the year. And I, that's why I think this is a good time to do it. It is a miracle that changed history and one of the most important doctrines of our faith as believers, which is the incarnation of God in Yeshua. Without him incarnate, we'll be still dead in our sins. So that was part of the introduction. Let's move to the word of God. And briefly, we will go through this. As we said, the parashat, uh, this, this Shabbat is names, Shemot. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we know that names are very important in Scripture. And in the life of Israel, names are given to people in Scripture because uh, biblical names reflect something about the person's history or his character, something that took place in their life or was going to take place in their life, or something about their character, something of the person. And so they're very, very important. And in Exodus 2, as we read earlier, we read the story of Moshe, Moses, who would become the great leader who delivered Israel from bondage. And we read that his name is of particular importance, as we read in verse 10, as was read earlier by Mayim. And it says... Then the child had grown some. This is uh, the uh, Moshe's sister, she says, that had given it to his mother to raise him. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter after he had grown. It doesn't say exact age. But remember, he was taken out of the water. And uh, the... Moshe's uh, sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, I can find his mother to uh, some uh, Hebrew mother to raise him. And she found his mother and Pharaoh's daughter agreed. Then she brought him back to him, to her. And then she says she began to raise him as her son. Very important. And she called him Moshe, which means pull out because I pulled him out of the water, she says. So it's, this is important. Uh, because it's interesting to see that the name not only refers to his childhood event when it took him out of the water of the Nile River, but also, I think, he was also pointing out to the future when Moshe would lead Israel to cross the Red Sea, and in a way, figuratively, God will pull them out of the water. Huh? In Exodus 14, when we see they're crossing the Red Sea and they cross in dry water, the God opened the waters and uh, 
and they cross. So in a sense, God was taken, pulling them out of the water as well. So in this case, the name Moshe refers to a life event. He was pulled out of the water. He will be also part of the Exodus crossing the Nile River. So that refers to this life event. In Matthew chapter 1, we have the story of Joseph, Joseph, hmm, encountered with an angel. And Joseph was Yeshua's earthly father, as some say he was his stepfather, uh, because he, he was, Yeshua was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And in this encounter, uh, Joseph has a dream, and in the dream, he's an angel. And in verse 20 of chapter 1, the angel assures Joseph that it's okay to take Miriam, Miriam as his wife because the child that she was carrying was conceived by the Holy Spirit, the Ruah HaKodesh. And so uh, then in verse 21, the angel tells Joseph what the child was going to be named. And she says, the angel says, Joseph, she will give birth to a son, and you are named to name him Yeshua, which means Adonai saves. Why? Because he will save his people from his sins. We read in Matthew 1, 21. And, and so Yeshua's name means salvation and refers to he, who he was and what he did. Remember, Moshe was... Uh, something that had to do an event in his life. Yeshua, his name has to do with who he was, his savior, Messiah, and what he was going to do, save people from their sins. I found some parallels and contrasts between Moshe and Yeshua that are interesting uh, in, uh, in their birth. Moshe was born into a Jewish family. Hmm? It says that he was born, Yeshua as well, was born into a Jewish family although they were from different tribes. Huh? Uh, Moshe's family was from the tribe of Levi or Levi. Uh, Yeshua's family was from the tribe of Judah, hmm, descendant of David, as a matter of fact, uh, because he had to fulfill those things. Uh, you remember that uh, the king of Egypt in the previous chapter, uh, in chapter one of, uh, of Exodus, it tells that because the Jewish people were growing so much, he was concerned that they would take over Egypt. So he decided to kill all the boys, the king of Egypt. Well, in Yeshua's time as well, when the wise men showed up asking for who, where is the king of the Jews, King Herod later tried to, uh, had all the children uh, um, younger than two years old uh, killed as well. So there's some parallels. Uh, Moshe was raised in the king's palace as um, the daughter, uh, the um, pharaoh's daughter raised him. Uh, so he was in the rich uh, you know, palace, although Yeshua was raised as a camp carpenter's son. So he was a humbler, a humbler uh, environment than where Moshe was raised. Uh, but it's interesting also that a Pharaoh's daughter adopted. He says she raised him as his son. Some other version says she adopted him as his son, Moshe as, as her son, excuse me. Uh, and this is interesting because Yosef also took Yeshua as his own son, although he had no part in his conception. Interestingly as well, uh, Moshe delivered Israel from slavery in Egypt. And as we know, Yeshua delivered Israel and the whole world from the slavery, from sin. Those are interesting parallels as well. And uh, through Moses, through Moshe, we receive the Torah. God's word came through him. He gave it to Moshe to share with us. Well, in Yeshua's case, he was God's word incarnate, as John tells us in the beginning, was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God, capital W. So he was God's word incarnate and living among us. And I think this is the last one I find. Uh, Moshe, of course, became one of Israel's greatest leaders. Uh, and... Yeshua became the greatest leader in Israel's history and in the history of the world. Uh, he changed history. 
and is still regarded, even for those who do not believe in him, as one of the greatest leaders of the whole world. Well, Yeshua's name is above all names. Uh, this is one of my favorite passages. Uh, I will tell you at the end, you know where it's at, those that know the scripture, but I will read it as we go along. Let your attitude towards one another be governed by your being in union with Messiah Yeshua, says the writer of this passage of scripture. And he says, though he was in the form of God, Yeshua, he did not regard equality with God something to be possessed by force. Other versions say he did not regard equality with God as something to cling onto or that he would give him a special thing. He, he was with God. He was God, but he didn't use that uh, as something to cling on to. Rather, on the contrary, the writer says, he emptied himself. Yeshua emptied himself from being God, and he took the form of a slave, becoming like human beings are. And so he became a man. And not only he became a man, but he became a little more than that. He took human form. And the writer says, and when he appeared as a human being, he humbled himself still more. Not only he humbled himself by becoming human from being God, becoming human, but he also became obedient to God the Father, even to death. He was a servant. He came to serve, he says. And not only that, but he gave his life. He, he, he was obedient even to death, even death on a stake as a criminal. So he left his glory in heaven. He humbled himself. But because of that, Therefore, is the word that, but because of that, as a result of him humbling himself from heaven and becoming human and becoming a servant and being obedient to the Father, God the Father raised him to be the highest place, gave him the highest honor, and gave him the name that is above every name. Hmm. No other name is like his. No other name is like Yeshua. The one we follow, our Messiah, our Savior, has the greatest name in the history of mankind. There's nothing greater than him. He is Messiah. He gave him the name that is above every name, that in the name, that in honor to the name given, Yeshua, in order that because of his great name, every knee will bow. That is part of prophecy. Where? In heaven and on earth, and under the earth. So in heaven, the angels worship him, and the hosts of heaven worship him. And on earth, those that follow him worship him. And one day, every knee will worship him when he comes back. <clears throat> and under the earth, and those even under the earth will worship him. And it says, and every tongue will acknowledge or confess in, from every people, every tribe, every nation, every tongue will acknowledge that Yeshua the Messiah he is Adonai, he is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Of course, you know, this is the scripture in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11. Well, uh, this is a beautiful passage, one of my favorite passages, talking about the pre-existence, uh, the incarnation, and the final glorification of Messiah Yeshua. Well, I want to conclude, I said this was going to be brief. One of the conclusions, Messiah's Yeshua's birth, I think you will agree with me, is worth remembering and celebrating for its, its significance. It is worth celebrating and remembering. He is the highest expression of Hashem, the name. In Hebrews chapter 1, in the New Testament, we read that God has spoken to us in many ways in the past through prophets at different times, but in the last day, he has spoken to us through his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. He says he's the radiance of God's glory, the exact expression of his nature. He sustains all things by his powerful word. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He became higher in rank than the angels, just as the name he inherited is superior to their So. He is the highest expression of Hashem, the name, and he's the name above 
all names. He is the only way to the Father. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other way. You want to know God? He says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. He is the only one who saves us from our sin through his perfect sacrifice on Calvary. That's the only one who saves us. That's the only one we can trust for the forgiveness of our sins because he is a perfect sacrifice. And we are saved from condemnation by trusting, believing in his name and surrendering our lives to him. The apostles preached this. Uh, uh, Peter preached that you have to believe in the name of Yeshua. Paul said you have to believe in the name of Yeshua. Uh, uh, we preach his name. Uh, they preach his name, and that's what we preach as well. So we, by believing and trusting in what he did for us uh, uh, in, the, uh, in on Mount Calvary, mm, he's shedding his blood so that his blood can cleanse us of all our sins. And my prayer is that if you haven't done so, if you haven't trusted, believed, and turned his life, your life to him, uh, surrender his life, confess your sins, and depend on him, I pray that uh, you will do so. And you will let him be born in your heart today as we celebrate his birth so that you have new life, abundant life, and you can be born again. Amen. That is my meditation for you today. Let me pray as we uh, conclude our, uh, I will stop sharing now. Let me pray as we close God's word. Father, we thank you for sending Messiah Yeshua, your own son, God himself, Emmanuel, God with us, to be born among us so that he could teach us, so that he could show us the way to you. And not only that, but so he was obedient to death gave his life, shed his blood, so that we can have forgiveness of sins and be forgiven. And we can have eternal, abundant life here. And he even rose from the dead so that we can have the hope of our own resurrection to spend eternity with you. We bless your name. Help us to remember and rejoice on his birth. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen and amen.